Welcome to today's virtual program at the Commonwealth Club. My name is Dan Pfeiffer. I'm one of the hosts of Positive America. I'm excited to be your moderator for today's program. This program is part of the Commonwealth Club's virtual series and is being done in partnership with the club's Inform division. We'd like to thank our members, donors, and supporters for making this and all other programs possible. We're grateful for their support and hope others will follow their example and help the club during these uncertain times. Please make a donation online or text DONATE to 415-329-4231. We also encourage you to like, subscribe, and share videos like this one with your friends and family. During our program, we will have time for your questions. Please submit those in the chat box, and I will ask them to Stacey Abrams as we go forward. Today, I'm excited to be talking to Stacey Abrams, the former minority leader of the Georgia House of Representatives and author of the amazing new book, Our Time Is Now, Power, Purpose, and the Fight for a Fair America. Stacey was the Democratic nominee for governor of Georgia in 2018, where she lost by the narrowest margin in over 50 years. In the aftermath of, math of that race, which was marred <clears throat> with voter suppression by her rival who oversaw his own election as Secretary of State, Stacey founded Fair Fight Action. Our Time Is Now builds on the work of Fair Fight Action. In the book, Stacey chronicles a chilling account of how the right to vote and the principle of democracy as we know it has been and continues to be under attack even now in 2020, maybe especially now in 2020. We'll spend the next hour discussing the importance of robust voter protections, identity politics, engagement in the census, and more. <clears throat> I am very excited to be joined by Stacey. Thank you so much, Stacey. Thank you, Dan. I appreciate you doing this. Well, it's great to see you. First, before we dig into the book and everything that is happening in this uh, very interesting time in American history, um, first, how are you? How are, I, I imagine when you sat down to write this book, you did not imagine that it would... Uh, be coming out in a world where you would be doing your book tour from your own home, I guess? Yes. I am in my dining room slash studio, and then I go to my office slash living room, and then I go to my pied de terre, which is my tiny little balcony when I need some fresh air. So I have a whole little enclave contained in my townhouse. That is, uh, well, I hope, I hope everyone in your family is healthy and doing well in these very tough times. I hope the same for your family. You know, we're doing okay. We, I mean, everyone's healthy. We could not be uh, more, we could not feel more blessed and we're uh, learning the joys of working from home with a two-year-old. So <laughs> that is. That, th those are, that's an interesting contrast. Yes, I'm going I, to. I annoy myself. <laughs> I think we have come to the point where we annoy, annoy our two-year-old and she uh, is very grateful when her grandparents come over. <laughs> I want to start by reading to you a official statement from the President of the United States. Because of mail-in ballots, 2020 will be the most rigged election in American in, the na in our nation's history. Unless this stupidity is ended, we voted during World War I and World War II with no problem. But now they are using COVID in order to cheat by using mail-ins, exclamation point. I said to myself when I was preparing for our event that I would, we would obviously talk about mail-in balloting. It's an important part of democracy reform, even not in the middle of a pandemic. And I was like, I will read Stacey Abrams, one of Trump's tweets about mail-in ballots. Little did I know he would have uh, four this morning before I get out of bed. So this is part of a larger effort by the, the president uh, to cast doubt on the election. So I wanted to ask you just about why he's wrong about mail-in ballots and why they and why you're such a big supporter of making them part of our plan. Sure. Okay, number one, every state in the country has some form of mail-in balloting. Uh, there are five states that do universal mail-in balloting, universal vote by mail. There are 34 states that have no excuses, including that five. There are 16 states that do mail-in balloting, but you, they require an excuse, usually age, infirmity, permanent disability, or you're not going to be at home uh, it varies. There are four that are hyper-restrictive, but every state in the country does this. What is different is that we have a disease that is communicable through contact, through closure of distance. So unlike World War I, World War II, we're much more in the Spanish flu e epidemic stage. And vote by mail is one of the few ways that you can preclude the likelihood of contracting a disease while participating in democracy. And so we want vote by mail because vote by mail allows as many people as possible to not be in line, to send in their ballots, to participate in democracy, 
democracy that ran during World War I, World War II, during the Civil War. We've never had to stop it. But this allows as many people as possible to not communicate a disease to another person because they have no choice. And we have to do that because there are portions of our population that have no choice. There are those who are in the disabled community for whom going to the polls is the only way they can cast their ballot with any degree of privacy. There are machines that allow them to use uh, to use the apparatus to actually you know, cast a private ballot, and that's what we want. We have people who have language barriers. It is illegal in a number of states for them to get help, and so they have to go to a polling place to get the assistance they need. We have people who are homeless, where vote by mail or, more importantly, vote from home does not work. They need to be able to show up. And because we are in the, the early throes of an eviction crisis, we know by November a lot of folks will simply not be able to get access to their absentee ballots because they're going to be displaced. They're going to likely need to show up at a polling place to cast a ballot. And then the final group are people who either tried to vote from home and couldn't do it or folks who just don't trust it, which is a legitimate concern given that African-American and Latino voters are twice as likely to have their absentee ballots rejected and young people are five times more likely to have their absentee ballots rejected. And so there are communities like places in Georgia where when a whole community came together to elect black people to the school board and they found themselves, the 12 organizers found themselves arrested when charged with 120 felonies for following the law with absentee ballots, there's a little bit of suspicion. So we allow for that suspicion by letting them go in person. And the whole point is vote by mail clears out the lines so that those who need to be in line can be, can socially distance and can vote without having to wait in line for eight to 12 hours. And so that's why it works. The second thing I'll say is this, Donald Trump is a fraud. And in, when it comes to this issue in particular, he votes by mail, his family votes by mail, his staff votes by mail. He does not like vote by mail because he has discovered that is easy, it's safe, and that it's convenient. And he recognizes, and one of the, the only true things I've ever heard him admit uh, in public and admit in public, he said that if he, if, if vote by mail was used in America to the extent possible, he would not win. I would love to prove him to be a truth teller for once in American history. And so that is why vote by mail is so important. And I think it's really, which you point out something that's really important about that it speaks to a lot of the themes you write about in your book, which is, as you're right, Donald Trump votes by mail, his family votes by mail. We found out today Mike Pence votes by mail. And they and they think that's totally fine, but it's not okay for other people. I want you to sort of talk about the sort of that the level of I mean that you obviously experienced firsthand in your campaign in Georgia and all your work you did, but um the sort of the how this sort of two tier democracy that Republicans uh, sort of want us to live in. Well, I would even say there are three tiers. There's the protected folks for whom voting has never been a question. They've never had their identities challenged. They've never had their access challenged. They've never had their legitimacy challenged, and they've never had their votes challenged. You have the second tier where I operate. I've been able to vote most of my life without impediment, but in the last two attempts I've made to cast a ballot, it's been problematic. And then you have this third group for whom voting requires encountering so many obstacles and so many challenges that either you become exhausted by the process or worse, you become convinced it's not worth it. For me, I went to vote in 2018, was told that I'd already cast a ballot, uh, that I'd voted absentee, which I hadn't. I'd never voted absentee before in my life. And luckily, I had a phalanx of cameras behind me and knowledge within me so I could explain the situation and work with the poll manager to get the situation resolved. But if I were a new voter, I would never have understood how to navigate that labyrinth of rules. And I would have been afraid to do so because that's how most disadvantaged or marginalized communities encounter. They either become hostile or they become afraid. And so one of those challenges is making sure that people feel that they have the authority to correct the problems. And typically most people are in that third category and they don't think they can. This year, I tried to vote by mail. My absentee ballot arrived eventually and the return envelope was sealed shut. 
So I had to become one of those people who went to vote in line on election day, because even though I could call the secretary of state, I could not get a return envelope. And so the two tiered system or three tiered system is so dangerous because the tiers are based on whether or not you want progress, whether you believe that you should be in included in this body politic and whether they think you're the right kind of people because most of the voter suppression tactics are targeted at communities of color, at young people and at poor communities. And that is not by accident because these are the communities that have been for so long kept out of our political process and who are clamoring to get in and they are terrified that their admission is going to change the power dynamic because it would. You know, I think that's a really important point because when you hear stories, you know, the like the example we just gave about your um, return ballot being sealed or the Democratic nominee for governor trailed by the press being misidentified on the voter rolls as someone had already voted, it seems like our electoral system, I mean, I think first and foremost, and particularly in Georgia, but all across the country, because this like the most egregious examples that we know about are off have are from Georgia, but we know hear them all over the place, even in places sometimes with Democratic governors. But the it seems like incompetence, but it's not just incompetence. You you talk a lot in your book about how it's malevolence it, it is behind the incompetence. Could, could you talk about that a little bit? Sure. There's, and, and I appreciate you mentioning Democratic governors because there's benign voter suppression that tends to happen because good intention meets calamity or challenge. Yep. And we've seen that. Uh, what happened in Wisconsin, you had a good Democratic governor who ran into the buzzsaw of Republicans who did not want voters to vote. And he, while he oversees the state, he does not oversee the voting system. In Georgia, we had incompetence and malevolence and malfeasance that operated together. There was nothing benign about it. In 2020, uh, so 2018, I, I you know, declare that I'm not gonna challenge the outcome of my election, not because I was happy with the outcome, but because I understood that the minute a politician challenges an election, all of the bad actions become about that person's ambition. And it was important to me that everyone understood I wasn't fighting to make myself governor. That, that wasn't the mission. I wanted to fight to make the system better. And that's why I sued the system instead of suing for my own election. And to be clear, I was very, very, very intentional about saying I acknowledge the legal sufficiency, but I will never concede that the election was right. And that has caused some consternation on actually both sides of the aisle, mostly on one side. Um, but, <laughs> but, but what happened in the aftermath was there were all these think pieces about how it wasn't possible and how I was just making it up until last Tuesday or two Tuesdays ago, when people saw in real time in Georgia, eight hour lines, 20 counties had to get judicial orders to extend their time. Thousands of people, tens of thousands, never got their absentee ballots, ballots they'd requested that they were told to request by the Secretary of State. The incompetence was, you know, he actually did the right thing in cooperation with Democrats, telling them to apply for the ballots, but his incompetence was that he then seeded out the process to a third party who couldn't be responsive to the voters who needed their help. And then you had the overlay of the existing voter suppression apparatus, the suppression that exists because of the questions, can you register and stay on the rolls? Can you cast your ballot? And can your ballot be counted? And in Georgia, we continue to have challenges with being on the rolls. We still have voter purges that happen. We still have some form of, of exact match, although we've been able through litigation to mitigate some of the harm. People couldn't cast their ballots because either their ballots never arrived, your ballot arrived, you couldn't use it, or they shut down your polling places. And that meant that we had six to eight hour lines. And we also had an operable machines, which gets to, does your vote actually count? We had tens of thousands of Georgians who were given provisional ballots or not given ballots at all. We had people who stood in line for six hours and then finally had to go pick up their child to go to work. And what happened in Georgia was a singular example of what happens across the country in different iterations. Georgia is particularly bad at democracy, 
but we're not the only state that has this problem. But the reason it was so important to see what happened in Georgia was that when you break the machinery of democracy to target black and brown communities, the problem is eventually the machinery breaks. And we had white Republican counties that had the same problems, maybe not to the same extent, but they finally had to admit that voter suppression is real and that whether it happens through incompetence or malfeasance, it's just as effective and just as nefarious. You brought up uh, how you did not challenge, but also did not concede your race. And that, that and you write in the book how that is a particularly annoyed many on the right, although as you point out, there's some on the left. And it is like one of the, the grand trophies of false equivalence you hear all the time when Democrats uh, decry the idea that even if Joe Biden wins, Donald Trump will not concede the election, which is a, um, I think it's a pretty logical guess since he has uh, lodged accusations of voter fraud in the election he won. So I imagine the election he loses, we would have a similar problem. But there are, they are very different things, right? And I know that. But can you help explain why you why you took, made the path you did to not, you know, quote unquote, conceive the election as that is, and to say that you won um, despite getting fewer votes, and we, why you went down that path? I think it's important for people to understand. I think it gives a great view into your view of politics and change. So, you know, traditional politics in America, we have this thing called concession. It is insufficient to simply be trounced by your opponent. You have to then acknowledge the trouncing and do so with grace and equanimity and say, I gave it the old college try, I'll be back. And that makes sense. If everyone played by the rules and if the rules were actually applied fairly. And what's been happening over the last 20 years, at least in the 21st century is that we have had successive elections where people were denied the right to cast their ballots, to have their ballots counted, to be included even though they were legally eligible. And that's what I frame as voter suppression. The problem is that that's not about the candidate. That's about whether actual voters, citizens of our country who are eligible to be heard, have the ability to do so. And what I object to, what I have objected to and worked against for the entirety of my adult life, I started registering voters before I was old enough to vote myself, is that I understand the power of the right to vote. It is transformative, it is singular, and it has to be protected and defended. And so when I decided, when I was making the decision about how I was going to respond to the outcome of the 2018 election, after 10 days of successive lawsuits, many of which we won. But by the time we were able to get the courts involved, so much of the malfeasance had already occurred. I had two choices, as I said. I could either choose to litigate my ability to continue on in the fight, or I could litigate the voters' right to be heard and participate in the system. And so when I didn't concede, I didn't go move into the governor's mansion or, you know, worm my way, you know, storm my way into the governor's office at the Capitol and sit, you know, and, you know, occupy the desk, refuse to be moved. Like, that's not what I did. Because I, under the rules of the election, under the laws as they exist, he was able to be the scorekeeper, the contestant, and the referee. By the rules, I did not become the victor. But by the numbers and by the knowledge of the need to transform an electorate into a group of people who believe they had the right to be heard, absolutely I won. And for me to acknowledge their victory, I could not concede that the system that interfered with them, that blocked them, that mocked them, that that system is legitimate. And so I did not concede. When Hillary Clinton conceded the election, but said that there are problems. What she was saying is not that she was going to storm the White House, but that she was going to call attention. I think what I did in 2018 was a bit more dramatic in part because my whole speech was about the fact that I was gonna, I wasn't gonna let him do it. And then I sued him and sued the state. But the difference between what what I have done in particular and what they are worried about Trump doing is not that he, they think he won't concede, they think he won't leave. And trying to hold on to power illegitimately is wrong. 
And I did not, I have not tried to assume power to myself that I was not given by the voters of Georgia. My point is we don't know what the voters of Georgia wanted to do because the person in charge of validating what they tried to do did not do his job properly. He cheated. He cheated people by running a system that disavowed and disenfranchised thousands of people. And because of his process, we will never know what actually should have happened. And that cannot be legitimated. So you look at what happened in Georgia, whatever that was last week, time is, I can't really understand what, how time operates anymore, but it seems it seemed to be recent. Um, or what happened yeah, in Wisconsin, sure. right? Or you know, what we're very worried about happening in Kentucky and New York tomorrow um, in those primaries. What can be done between now and November to limit that amount of chaos or to, or to make, make voters feel more secure about their own personal safety and going to vote, but also faith that it is a, as close to a fair election as this country is able to muster in 2020? So the first thing is making sure that we know what the problems are. And the best way to know what problems are is to test. And so we need to think about these primaries as beta tests. They are telling us in 2020 what the problems are in our electoral system. In Georgia, apparently the problem is voting. <laughs> you know, that just doesn't seem to work. Um, <laughs> in Wisconsin, it was that we have we had a Supreme Court that joined with the state Supreme Court and with the state legislature to say that lives don't matter and that you should risk your life to cast your vote because we are too lazy and too mean to allow you to use a mechanism we put in place for exactly this reason. What's going to happen in Kentucky tomorrow, and I know a lot of people have heard about the closure of the polling places, and there have been a lot of people who've been vouching for the aggressive vote by mail system that was actually authorized by the Republican Secretary of State and very much supported in his way through by Governor Bashir. He has tried his best to give me people to vote. But that's why I go back to my original point. It's not just about people being able to vote by mail. It is about people being able to vote in the way that is best for them. That's how democracy is supposed to work. You're supposed to be able to allow a voter to meet the moment. And if that moment means you can vote from home, great. But if it doesn't, then it is the obligation of the state to provide an alternative. And the challenge in Kentucky is that the alternative looks to be remarkably insufficient, particularly given the legitimate distrust that African-Americans have of vote by mail. And because this is a brand new system, there, there are some folks who are first adopters. They go out there the minute there's a new tool, they get it. There are folks like me who only have, I only have an iPhone 7 because they will no longer give me a 6. And I didn't even go with the S because that just seems too <laughs> newfangled to me. And so we have to recognize that the operation of voting has to meet people where they are. You don't have to create special opportunities, but the ones that they are used to, you don't get to pull the rug out from under them without giving them a legitimate alternative. And vote by mail is not a legitimate alternative for everyone. But the other reality is states are cash strapped. They are buckling under the economic collapse that is the current economy driven by Donald Trump and his inability to acknowledge that a pandemic was upon us. And so each county, each city, each state has had to grapple in their own way. The tax dollars that aren't flowing are not flowing to the local administrators who have to run these elections, to the counties, to the states. But we anticipated this back when Alexander, Alexander Hamilton was kind of you know, coming into faction, when he, created the, when he created the sense that we as a nation we band together to finance one another because the federal government in times of crisis has the only ability to really solve these problems. We need the HEROES Act to pass. The HEROES Act is the only way we can use these primaries as proof points that without that money, November is going to be a calamity. But with those resources, we can scale up vote by mail. So everyone who wants to vote by mail, which will be even more than we're seeing in these primaries, and the primaries are telling us a lot of people, Democrat, Republican, independent, agnostic, they all want to vote by mail. This tells us what they need. But it also tells us we're going to have to create early voting in a lot of states so that people can go and vote and not risk their lives, that we're going to have to have in-person voting and we're going to have to maintain the polling locations for in-person voting because 
people don't just want to go vote near their homes just because it's fun. It's because they often lack the transportation. They often lack the ability to get somewhere else. In Georgia, we know that because of the 214 polling places shut down in 2018, between 54 and 85,000 people could not cast a ballot. If you live in a rural community and what was 10 miles away is now 50 miles away, it might as well be on the moon. And so we have to recognize that the primaries are how we learn what we need for the general. And I wanna say just a moment of thank you to you and the, the guys at Crooked Media, because we, through Fair Fight, have been in place in 18 states, able to gather the data and, and inform voters, build volunteer lists, do the advocacy, because you helped us get there, because we knew the primary was going to be necessary to understand the general. We didn't know it was going to be necessary to understand a pandemic that was crushing democracy, but we knew something was going to go wrong. The, you know, you've, you've brought this up a couple of times, and I think it'd be helpful for the viewers and listeners tonight to understand as you've talked about the, you've mentioned two things that one is problems with what is called quote unquote exact match and another, which is a very related situation, which is historic distrust of mail-in balloting in the African American community. Can you explain how, uh, how the what exact match signature match whatever you call it, has been used to disenfranchise uh, voters of color, in particular Black Americans. Sure. So exact match is actually a process. I think Georgia, Florida, and a couple of other states use. It was pioneered by Chris Kobach and a few others, where you have to exactly match your identity to some random database in order to be allowed to register to vote. We've been able to mitigate that harm in most states. It's still terrible, horrible idea racially discriminatory, captured 53,000 people in Georgia in 2018, 80% of whom were people of color, 70% of whom were African-American. But then you have the scourge of signature mismatch. Signature mismatch says that when you get at that absentee ballot, when you sign the back swearing that it is you who filled out that, that ballot and you send it in, a poll worker then tries to match your signature to the last signature they had on file for you, whatever signature that is. Now, in some states, it's the signature you provided months ago. In other states, it's the signature you provided 30 years ago when you got your when you got your driver's license or you first got your voter ID card, um, your, your voter registration card. And what it says is that this untutored person is going to use the forensic files episode she saw on television the night before, and she's going to match your signature to the thing that she sees, and it's usually women who are who are poll workers, so I'm not being uh, gender biased, um, they're gonna match these things up. Every forensic scientist will tell you it is junk science, that it is nearly impossible for people to do this because your signature differs based on the implement you use, the surface you're writing on, and the surface beneath the surface you're writing on. As I put it, my signature doesn't match from CVS to Kroger, and yet in a number of states, this mismatch is used to disqualify applications. And guess what? It is most often used to disqualify applications of African-Americans, Latinos, and young people. Black and Latinos, it's twice as likely to kick your absentee ballot out. And for young people, it's five times more likely that something's gonna cause your absentee ballot to be rejected. It is junk science that tells you nothing. It just makes people feel better. But if you are the first, this is the first time you voted by mail, if you go through this process and then your vote is rejected and they don't tell you it's because it's your signature, they just say your vote's been rejected if they tell you at all, why would you then invest in a process where when you finally decide to try it, they tell you not that it didn't work, but that you failed. And that's what is so insidious about voter suppression. Signature mismatch polling place closures, it all makes the voter feel like they did something wrong. And if they are the mistake, then no one is responsible. My mission is to make certain we know that we hire people to make this work. And that if they are not willing to do their jobs, they should not have their jobs. And their fundamental job is protecting and engaging us in our democracy. You tell, you write, that, you write in your book about a story that your grandmother told about how after not being able to vote for many, 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 for all of her life, she was finally able to be able to vote. When it came time to vote, she was afraid to do so. 
and the efforts it took to convince her. That is a con- the conversation that happened in your family with your grandmother is one that I think is going to happen all around this country uh, because now people will be have legitimate reason to be afraid for their lives or the lives of their family if they live with someone with comorbidity or they themselves have some pre-existing condition. But there's another element of this is what you addressed is people are going to be asked to go out and vote believing there could very well be eight hour lines, you know, and then at the end of that process, your vote may not count for any, for an array of reasons that you mentioned. How do you have that conversation in 2020 with someone who is afraid to go vote either for health reasons or because of fear that it, their vote will not count based on a body of evidence put forward over the last few elections? So my mission in writing this book was answering that question. One of the most effective ways to fight fear is to call it what it is, to acknowledge it's either legitimacy or it's fallacy. And people are right to be afraid of the process of voting in America, particularly if they are in a community that's been targeted. And so part of my mission since 2018 has been to serve as a clarion call to say, it's not in your head. They really are after you. Because when you shift the notion from paranoia to awareness, paranoia makes you feel bad, but it also convinces you there's no solution. Awareness tells you how to prepare. And so talking about voter suppression, debunking the myth of voter fraud is how we prepare people to know they're going to have to work hard. It's not fair. It's not right. But it is necessary. The second part then is to tell them what else can happen. That's why I talk about the toolkit of voting. Not just vote by mail, but early po- in-person early voting and voting day of. And we need people to know they have these options so they can pick the best option for them. And so they can demand the options they need. If the HEROES Act passes the Senate, that act will guarantee that in every state in the nation, you have absentee balloting, early in-person voting, and in-person voting on the day of. That's what we need in every state where that's necessary. We've got five states that have been at this long enough with universal mail. They've already adapted, but most other states have not built this process. And so the first is making sure you debunk the fear. The second is that you arm people with the truth of what they can do. But then the third is to remind people why we vote in the first place. I've gotten a a great deal and, and, and I'm very appreciative of being considered a voting rights warrior or champion. Voting is an action. I do this work because I grew up poor and black in Mississippi, because I lived poor and black in Georgia, because I'm now still black, but I'm no longer poor. And I want other people to have that opportunity because it's so much better on this side. And the only way we get here is through changing policies. I do this because I have a brother who has been in and out of the carceral system, in and out of mental health challenges, and in and out of drug addiction. And I want him to get the help he needs. He is finally able to be stable and he's in a great program, but that's because I've had opportunities that most people don't have. I need everyone to have the opportunities I've been able to access for my brother. I want voting to happen because the world we need will change and become closer to that world only if we vote. These systems that people are demonstrating against and rightly so that we are decrying and rightly so, these systems are people. People make these choices. People pass laws, people break laws, people decide whether these laws are stupid and need to go and whether these laws are good and need to be reinforced. And we have to use voting to change the people. And so the third thing I will tell folks is we have to vote because our lives actually depend on it. We have seen the trailer for what is to come in the apocalypse of a second term of Donald Trump and a second you know, governing, governing reign of Mitch McConnell. We know what they're willing to do to the courts. And so the third thing I tell folks is it is worth risking something because we know that the consequence of an action is that evil will reign. And that's something I'm just not willing to live with. I first met you in 2018, right after you won uh, the nomination and you appeared at a Pod Save America show um, and the crowd was quite enthusiastic for you. And Mm -hmm. there you could feel real um, magic and momentum. And I, th- I think I said this just time. My brother has lived in Georgia for the last 20 years almost now. And 
Like there was something very different about when you were at the top of the ballot in terms of something to be excited about. And I thought you ran a truly remarkable campaign that captured the imagination of the nation. What from like what lessons do you take from your from your campaign that you think are applicable, not just to Joe Biden in 2020, but to anyone out there who's running anywhere up and down the ballot? So in our time is now, I spend the first half of the book basically laying out all the things we need to be afraid of, angry about, and just pissed off about. But the second half of the book is about how we can fix it and what our internal challenges are, what, what's to come. And one of the pieces, one of the chapters is called The Playbook. Uh, and another chapter is about identity. And, and those are the two chapters I think are the most important for this question. Number one, I won transformation of Georgia because I believe in identity politics. This is a nation built on identity. At the very beginning, it was determined that white men who owned land could vote, that black people weren't human, that Native Americans were ripe for slaughter, that women should be silent, and soon thereafter, every other community was basically prescribed from even bothering, bother, they, weren't, they shouldn't even bother to try to come. And then of that class of people who were allowed to vote white men, only 6% were actually able, only 6% of Americans were legitimately able to vote under some anal historical analysis. Their identity gave them power that was denied to everyone else. I believe in identity politics because we are at a demographic inflection point where that power should belong to people whose identities differ from our inception. And for that to be made so, people have to have the right to vote, but more importantly, politicians and anyone running for office has to acknowledge the legitimacy of identity. Because all we're saying is we see, the bar we see you, we hear you, and we understand the barriers to your ability to access opportunity. I embraced identity politics, didn't shy away from it, talked about it. I did everything I could to demonstrate that it wasn't just lip service. And I ran a campaign that didn't disclude, didn't disinvite anyone, but invited everyone to understand that their identities matter too, but that I was going to give primacy to the identities that for so long had been pushed out of any access to power in our communities. But the second part of the campaign, the second part of the book, the playbook, talks about how do you turn that into a national phenomenon. I'm a good candidate. I, I'm a pretty effective speaker and I'm pretty detail oriented, run pretty good campaigns. But everybody can do this. Anyone running should be held accountable for having an authentic message that comes from their value system, not from a consultant's playbook. They have to be willing to invest in every legitimate voter. You don't get to pick voters because someone's algorithm told you that's who you should talk to. My parents are super voters. They have never missed an election. And yet I can tell you that for most of my time growing up, no politician ever knocked on their door because they were not seen as valuable voters because of where we lived. Yet their votes counted. And so every person running needs to believe that every voter matters in this process and that they deserve to have some investment. Now, the investment should be commensurate to the likelihood of them voting for you, which means on the progressive side, on the democratic side, We've got to start investing more in the people who look and sound like what we need and less on the people who've told us many times, we don't like you, we don't want you, go away. I'm not saying you don't talk to them. I'm just saying spend more money on the folks who say, I'll go out with you if you bother to invite me and less money on the person who keeps slamming the door on you and is thinking about getting a restraining order. Let's go with that one. And then the last thing is that that investment has to be consistent. It is insufficient to ask someone to support you only before election, but never to come back and never to be held accountable for what you did or did not do. One of the issues I care about deeply is criminal justice reform. And so I can point to my record. I can point to the people who came to see me and said, Stacy, this is what we need. And I can show them year after year after year what I tried to do, what I got done and how I did it. That accountability was important because people had to know that I was going to do what I said. They didn't know about my brother, but they knew when they came to see me that I listened. And if we want politicians to do their job, if we want the kind of reforms that we're talking about, then they have to be held accountable for who they are, who they talk to, and what they do. And since I'm not currently running for anything, I can say they and not me. 
And a big part of your campaign was also going everywhere, right? You had a very focus on grassroots organizing and door knocking and traveling the state. You went to every county in Georgia. How do you, have you thought about how someone can run that campaign in the situation we're in now where not only can you not go everywhere, you may not be able to go anywhere? Absolutely. Part of campaigning is storytelling. It's being able to be in a space with someone. It's being able to hear them, to understand what they're asking you about and to give them authentic engagement. And so I think we have to recognize that there are gonna be populations that we can reach through Zoom and through every other platform digitally, but we are gonna have swaths of our nation for whom this is never gonna be the answer. And that's why you have to make those phone calls. That's why you have to do the hard work of building phone trees, but also sending mail. We're gonna to have to go more analog with a lot of voters. But what carries the day more than anything is simply communication. I talk about this in the book. There are a whole slew of folks who are called unlisted, who never hear from a single campaign because they didn't vote. They get taken off the rolls or taken off the list. And because they're taken off the list, they never get information. And because they never get information, they don't vote. And if those unlisted folks had been able, had been engaged and had actually voted at the same level of people who have their profile who did vote, Democrats would have won every single election, I think since 1996. Because we, we cut off our nose to spite our face. We are so fearful of losing, we forget to win. And we can win by meeting people where they are. I don't care, if, I mean, I went to where they filmed Deliverance because I wanted to win. I went to one music fest. I went to temples and I went to mosques. I was in a gay pride parade. I went to things and did things no candidate at my level had ever done because I believe that I was doing the right thing and I wasn't ashamed to go and talk to everyone about it. We have to be willing to win elections by doing the nitty gritty work, but also by doing the high illustrative work of telling the truth out loud to everyone. And, you know, I'm from the deep South, you know, tell the truth and shame the devil. We need to say what we believe and stop being afeard of the wrong person overhearing us. Because the challenge is when we don't tell the truth, they hear us anyway. But the people who don't like us won't believe us, and the people who believe in us will lose faith. And so my belief is that we can do this. We can absolutely do this up and down the ballot, but we've got to be willing to do the hard work and find the voters that we've written off for too long. You mentioned earlier how we are at a demographic inflection point in this country, which is undoubtedly true. You know, do you th when you look at what's ha been happening happening in the streets of America uh, for the last month since the deaths of George Floyd and Breonna Taylor and so many others, do you do you think we are potentially at a political or cultural inflection point where America more more of America comes to terms with both our what our past really was and what our present currently is and begin begin to think constructively about where we're going? I absolutely do because I remember this moment from 1992. I was a student at a college during the aftermath of a beating by cops of a black man. And when the Rodney King decision was announced, when they were exonerated, demonstrations flared across the country, including in Atlanta. We demonstrated, some of the demonstrations got violent. They tear gassed our campuses, they tear gassed the neighborhoods. And within a few days, there was still anger, but there was no movement. But we also ended up having a presidential election that was not a referendum on whether we were going to tackle police brutality. It wasn't a referendum on the ravages of poverty and how police brutality intersected with other social inequalities and inequities like decrepit housing and the, in the inability for most communities to take care of themselves if they were communities of color. We had a banal conversation about the economy but we didn't grapple with the inequities. And in fact, within four years, we had welfare reform. I believe the difference is that the people who can vote now are the people who are affected now and that the population is sufficiently large and sufficiently affected that they believe that they can do something different. That's why they've stayed on the streets, not for an extra few hours, but for extra weeks. But we're also seeing, luckily in some cities, and unfortunately not in as, not in as many, 
we're seeing actual action being taken by political leaders. And what I call on activists to do are three things. One, we need them to continue to protest and demonstrate in the streets. But we also need to protest at the ballot box because voting feels slow and plotting and sometimes inefficient and often ineffective. But it is the way we have made change. It is the way that we got the 65 Voting Rights Act. It's the way we got the Affordable Care Act. These things may be insufficient in their totality, but they are so much more than we had before. And each time we make that progress, we make better progress and more progress possible. And then the last thing is I need people to fill out the census because we are not simply rerunning the 2016 election. That's what everyone thinks about, get Trump out. We are also running the 2010 election. And we need to remember just how much of a debacle that was. That was a census year where people didn't vote from the Obama coalition and Republicans ran the table and they set the agenda for a decade. The rollback of almost every set of progressive rights that we've been able to gain in many states disappeared. Reproductive rights, criminal justice reform, environmental action, healthcare, everything that people have been able to do we saw the turnover of power that became cemented and it was because people did not think about the fact that the census was going to determine the lines of political power for a decade. And if you live in a COVID-19 community that has yet to see its fair share of resources, it's also because your community was undercounted in 2010 and they've been ignoring you for a decade. And specifically, I mean, it's, I'm so glad you brought up the census, specifically, like, what would you tell people to do right now, right? Like, people who say, yeah, of course we fill the census. Like, how do I go about doing that? If I, like, I think, okay. I think, like, <clears throat> normally you would, someone would come to your door and knock on your door and remind you to fill out the census. I assume in large parts of the country that is not happening right now. So I spent a whole chapter in the book talking about the census, but here's the short, short version. Number one, go to my2020census.gov. Fill out your census online. 80% of the census was expected to be filled, filled out online. 20% was expected to be done through the enumerators knocking on your door and through the handout of uh, the hand delivery of packets to rural communities. That rural delivery affects 6.2 million people and it's been delayed again and again. I think they're finally starting to deliver those packets. That includes Native American reservations. One of the reasons Michelle Lujan Grisham had to go on national television and beg for support for the Navajo Nation across three states was that the Navajo Nation, the Apache Nation, and Native Americans writ large have been largely undercounted in the census for decades. So go to my2020census.gov or and when, while you're there, you can write down the phone number and you can give it to anybody you know who can't go online. You can call in and do the census by phone and you can do it in I think more than 50 languages. But not only make sure that you do the census, make sure everyone you know completes the census, including the undocumented. The census is not a count of citizens, despite what Donald Trump wanted us to believe. It is a count of every person who lives in America as of April 1st. And that means if you're here, you count. We need to tell folks. I created a second organization called faircount.org. That's all we do is help people get counted in the census Get when we have toolkits, we've got all the information you ever need, but at faircount.org, we can tell you what you can do to not only get yourself counted, but to make sure your community gets counted too. And then the last thing is this, I'll do it very quickly. If you have a cell phone or a light bill, they know how to find you. Fill out the census so you get your money and your political power. They can't use it to track you. They can't use it to arrest you. If you have warrants, it doesn't really matter. The census can be used for nothing except data and getting money back to where you live and back to the communities you care about. Now I'm done. That was great. That was that was perfect. I hope everyone sees that because um, this is uh, as someone who was uh, obviously working in politics in the 2010 election and have been suffering the consequences of it ever since. Uh, this is we have to win this election. We also have to get the census right for the reasons you say. Um, you know, like we talk when we, when we talk about the problems of our democracy, they are oftentimes the visible ones that we see when you know the line you know the eight hour lines in georgia or the voting machines that don't work or you know obviously what happened in your election but there are larger structural forces that are enabling that enable it let me say this way there are larger structural forces that are designed to diminish the power of the 
growing, progressive, diverse majority in this country. And that's not an accident. That is a very specific reason why it's happening. And, you know, obviously, because what happened in 2016, Democrats are now very focused on the Electoral College as a problem. But we view it as a problem because it allowed Donald Trump to become president despite getting fewer votes. And if he gets reelected, he will almost certainly get reelected once again, having received fewer votes, probably by a larger margin than before. But there's something much bigger and more nefarious about, but related about the Electoral College. Can you talk about how it enables structural racism and white supremacy in our American politics? Sure. So the Electoral College was racist in classes at its inception. The North wanted the Electoral College because they didn't trust average people to be able to choose the chief executive of the country. And let's be clear, the North wasn't you know a, a great place. It, it was actually in the North that literacy tests were first created because they were created to stop immigrants from voting because they didn't trust them if they didn't understand and write English very well. The South, having already achieved the three-fifths compromise for Congress, to give themselves political power without having to count the souls of black folks, they wanted the same privilege extended to the Electoral College. And so the Electoral College is premised on the exact same Faustian bargain that denied humanity to black people until 1870, known as the Electoral College. It was deeply racist. They wanted to have the political power based on their population, which was roughly equal to the North, but they didn't want to have that pesky consequence of letting people actually have a say in their lives or have their lives actually matter. Maybe, you know, black lives having to matter. Anyway, so that's the inception of the Electoral College. But what's happened since then is that we know that the Electoral College was never, ever, ever about whether Idaho was going to be outmatched by New York. They didn't know about Idaho at the time of the Electoral College. They were not concerned about tiny states being overly dominated by large states. What they did know was that communities that remained in the minority in larger, organ in larger states, that they would never be able to amass enough power to actually have their votes count. So instead of all black people in America being able to vote and having their votes count as one per vote per person, which is what we keep saying we believe in, when it comes to picking the president, your vote only counts if you live in a state where they already agree with your politics. Since roughly 85 to 90% of black people vote democratic, you would imagine that our participation would guarantee a swing in an election. But it doesn't work that way because 58% of us live in the South where almost every Southern state votes Republican. So even though we have large populations, we have almost no say in the presidency in the South. We also know that where people go, where govern, where presidential candidates visit, it's driven by their electoral college math. And the reality is, if they don't think they have to worry about you, they're not coming to where you are, and they're not going to do anything to incentivize your behavior. It's why we have ethanol, but no Medicaid expansion. That's the challenge. And just go back for one second to the census, we also need to recognize that one of the challenges of the census is called prison gerrymandering, where people are counted where they're incarcerated, but have no ability to participate in the election. And guess who, what the majority populations of most of these prisons are? Black and brown folks who once again get counted for their bodies, but not for their souls and not for their humanity. You talked about how most of the states in the South tend to go red, particularly in a presidential election. That is something that you believe, uh, I know very passionately, uh, does not have to always be the case. Uh, so Georgia, so I would take it that you believe that Georgia can and should be a major battleground state in 2020. We are. Any state where they have to worry about whether they can win, that's a battleground state. In this primary, despite the debacle and the incompetence, the sheer deliberate indifference of the Secretary of State to the needs of voters, Democrats have not only surpassed our 2008 primary numbers, we have surpassed every record that we have, including we have outvoted Republicans by 182,000. Now, some will dismiss this and say, oh, it's a primary. We've never had a primary like this. <laughs> Even my election, which was one of the high watermarks, was only a little over half a million people who actually turned out and voted. And so we have to remember that this primary is a harbinger of, of good. 
if Democrats are willing to invest. And the bonus is we've got 16 electoral votes and not one, but two Senate seats. And for those who think, well, we only have to focus on, you know, Colorado and Maine and, and uh, you know, North Carolina and Arizona, and then we've got the numbers we need. We don't need four seats. We need 10 seats. We need as many seats as we can amass because, by the way, there's another election coming up in two years. And so we need as many Senate seats as we can get to get as close as possible to a solid majority where if someone defects or gets confused and wanders off, that we have enough votes to still get good done. And so Georgia should be on everybody's mind. And more importantly, their money should be invested in Georgia's success. To win Georgia, Joe Biden will have to reconstitute the Abrams coalition. What does he need to do to do that? Um, the things I said earlier. One, it's have actual conversations with Georgia voters and not cherry pick college educated white women, who I won, by the way. Um, or sorry, I won more of them than any Democrat has won in 30 years. I got 31% of them, which is, a, that's, a, a, that's a landslide in Georgia for a Democrat. <laughs> Uh, but we were able to triple Latino turnout, triple Asian Pacific Islander turnout, increase youth, youth, increase youth participation by 139%, increase Black participation by 40%. We increased white participation for Democrats for the first time in 30 years. It was because we actually talked about the issues that matter. It was because we talked to everyone. We did not have that terrible breakdown of, likely voters and unlikely voters, persuasion targets and turnout targets. Everyone was a persuasion target because you were either persuading them to vote for you or persuading them that voting matters. And we treated both of those endeavors as equally necessary and equally legitimate and it worked. And then it's about making sure that there's an authentic attempt to actually engage those voters. And we can do that in Georgia and we can do it around the country, but in Georgia in particular, we have primed voters to believe that their voices matter. Because by the way, we also have the sixth district that we took from the Republicans up again, but we also have a very competitive seventh, election, seventh congressional district. And we can't take for granted that because we currently hold the house that we always will, we've got to keep amassing our numbers. You can win Georgia by investing in Georgia, by doing the kind of work that I actually have seen Vice President Biden's campaign already start to do but it has to be consistent, it has to be statewide, and it cannot be an Atlanta campaign. You don't win Georgia by winning Atlanta, you win Georgia by winning Georgia. And there are enough people who've been harmed by Trump's farm policies, by his faux trade war, the decimation of communities because of the ineptitude of the governor and the president on the issue of COVID-19, there are people who are ripe and ready and desperate for change. And Georgia gives you 16 electoral college votes. Do what I did and we can win. Because, oh, by the way, we've registered another 300,000 plus folks, the majority of whom are young people and people of color. So it's a pretty good sign that we've got, we can cover the margin on the 500,000 or the 55,000 for me. The, you know, <clears throat> we were talking earlier about sort of the, the historic moment that we are living in. And I am curious as to what, what, what you think Democratic leaders, the Democratic Party needs to do to keep faith with and do right by the people who have been protesting in the streets. Like what, what does it look like? We've seen a moment like before you talk about 1992 where this happens and then everyone turns their focus away. And like, what is, what is a, a Democratic Party or a Democratic campaign in the fall look like that embraces the sentiments that have put people in the streets over the last month? First, we have to have what I think we've seen from the vice president and others, which is an authentic engagement, conversations where we listen more than we talk. But that has to also be met with actual policies not platitudes, but legitimate policies that say, this is how we will address these challenges. And part of it is recognizing that those policies, while they may begin with the murders of George Floyd and Breonna Taylor and you know, Rayshard Brooks, we have to think about what happened to Ahmaud Arbery 
who was killed not by law enforcement, but by someone that law enforcement then allowed to just go on their merry way. And so we've got to have this broader lens on what is causing this unrest. What happened in 92 was not simply the police brutality and the exoneration in the case of Rodney King, it was the poverty and the inequity and the seeming disinterest in change. And so we have to see policy that speak to something broader than police reform, which is absolutely vital. What the reason we keep hearing this cry about reallocation of funding is because we need to hear and believe that there will be investment in education that legitimately enga engages children and makes certain that young people graduate with degrees that are worth having and with the knowledge they need to be successful. We have to fix healthcare. We have to deal with climate change. There's a story today about how those in Cancer Alley are being ravaged even more by COVID-19 because they've been weakened by the pollution. And so we have to have these broader conversations. And so to win and to, to cement the trust that is available to us, we have to actually acknowledge how hard it's going to be, but still say what we think should be. And that's what I keep telling folks. We cannot lie and say that electing a single person or a coalition is gonna change the world. It never does. But it is the only way we move forward and this is going to take time and we have to demand that they hold us accountable and that if we don't do the work that they get rid of us and hire someone new, but give us the chance to do right and believe us when we say it because we're not just saying it, we're showing you what it looks like. We have time for one last question, Stacey. Okay. And uh, so I would like to ask you, what is it that keeps Stacey Abrams so hopeful and optimistic in this time we're living in? I am not optimistic. I, and, and I mean it this way. I'm, I consider myself an ameliorist. I think the glass is half full. It's just probably poisoned. But <laughs> I was raised by two people who were civil rights activists as teenagers. They were the children of day laborer, of laborers and domestic workers and cooks. And they were the children of sharecroppers and they were the children of slaves. And in 2018, I became the first black woman in America to have the opportunity to stand as the candidate for governor in the history of a country. And I did it in the deep South in Georgia. I did it by not competing against just someone who didn't like me. I competed against the Republican party in the deep South and I nearly beat them. And, but for their behavior, I probably would have become governor. I believe we can fix this because I have seen the progress. I was able to work with Republicans to do police accountability legislation that finally stopped letting police officers sit in their own grand jury hearings. I was able to pass legislation to help fix criminal justice issues from juvenile justice to private probation to just making sure that people had fair sentencing. I, I believe in this moment because I've been able to work on all these issues, not in places where it's easy to have these conversations, but in the toughest part of our country. And I believe it's possible because I've been able to do it. I believe we can fix this country. I believe we can make this country stronger and better. And I believe our future is bright, but we have to work at it and it's going to go dark and dim over and over again. COVID's just one example, but what is better and what is so resilient about who we are is that the more there are more of us than there are of them. Being a conservative is about holding to what we have. Being a progressive is about reaching for what we can get. I believe that we can be progressive. I believe that we can win. And I believe that our time is now. That was a, I can tell you've been on the book tour circuit because that was an amazing, very natural book promo. Stacey, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, I Always a pleasure to talk to you. I always feel more hopeful after talking to you. Stacey is the author of Our Time Is Now. We encourage you to order your copy of Stacey's new book through your local independent bookstore. We'd also like to thank our audience for watching and participating live. If you'd like to support the club and watch more virtual programs, visit www.commonwealthclub.org online. I'm Dan Pfeiffer. Thank you, everyone, and stay safe out there. <laughs>